Okay, I think we should make a start. So look, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Aviva's 2022 Annual General Meeting. I'm George Colmer, your chair, and I'm delighted to be standing here in front of you this afternoon. Our AGM is an important event. It lets us update you on the company's progress and gives you a chance to tell us what's on your mind. For the last couple of years, of course, we've had to do all this virtually. So it's a particular pleasure today to finally gather in person. Today, though, we also have the best of both worlds and welcome also to all of you who have joined the meeting online, taking advantage of the technology we relied on last year to join the proceedings from wherever you happen to be. Having that flexibility and convenience to give more shareholders more opportunities to be part of our AGM is surely a good thing. In the same hybrid spirit, joining me here on the stage is your CEO, Amanda Blanc, your CFO, Jason Windsor, our company secretary, Kirsty Cooper, and non-executive directors, Shona Jemmett page Martin Strobel, Pippa Lambert, Patrick Flynn, Andrea Blantz, Jim McConville, and Michael Meyer. I'd especially like to welcome Martin, Shona, and Andrea, who are new to the board this year, and who bring with them exceptional experience and expertise. Meanwhile, with us via video link are Mahit Joshi, Patricia Cross, and Belen Romana Garcia. Belen and Patricia will both retire after this meeting, and I'd like to thank them for their outstanding contribution and to this board. Jason will also not be standing for re-election following the announcement in January that he will resign as CFO with effect from July. Jason has been a valued colleague since he joined the group over a decade ago, and I would like to thank him for his commitment and contribution during his time with Aviva. Now, with introductions out of the way, I can confirm that in line with our Articles of Association, we have the necessary quorum of shareholders in the room and joining virtually so we can crack on with the meeting. The notice of meeting was made available to shareholders in early April and sets out the resolutions being put to the meeting today. I'm not going to read out each resolution now, but I will give an overview in the formal part of the meeting later on. To give those joining virtually time to place their votes online, I now declare voting open on all resolutions for any shareholder, proxy or corporate representative who is entitled to vote and will remain open for the duration of the meeting. The resolutions and voting options should appear on your screen. Instructions on how to vote and ask questions can be found on the homepage as well as on the online guide you can find in the Documents tab. For those of you present in the room and who are entitled to vote, you'll have been given a white poll card at registration, and you'll get to use these in a little while. Before that, however, and before handing over to Amanda, I'd like to give just a very brief flavor of the year from my perspective. As I wrote in the annual report, for me, 2021 was the year Aviva began to deliver on its promise. We are on the road to becoming the business that our customers, our colleagues, and you, our shareholders, deserve it to be. I'm not going to go into all the details, but in the last 12 months, we made great progress against our strategy and delivered a strong financial performance. We've announced a 4.75 billion capital return. We've set ourselves ambitious goals for the top line, for better business performance and for growth in capital and cash. And we have set a new dividend policy. Now, we still have a long way to go, of course, but overall, I'm very proud of what everyone has achieved and that our people have not lost sight of the vital role we play in our customers' lives, living up to our purpose to be with you today for a better tomorrow. This brings me to my final point. Our duty as a business to act at all times in a responsible, sustainable way. We've been very clear that acting sustainable 
sustainably is an integral part of our approach and a foundation of our strategy. That's why this year we've placed such an emphasis on extending our leadership on environmental, social and governance issues and fleshed out the steps needed to hit our ambition to be net zero by 2040. As we did last year, we remain committed to seeking an advisory vote from this meeting on our climate-related financial reporting, which is covered today under Resolution 3. It only remains for me to thank all our people for their extraordinary efforts over the past year. The challenge has been enormous, but Amanda, her team, and the entire community of Aviva colleagues are continuing to do a tremendous job. And I will now hand over to Amanda. Thank you, George, and hello, everyone. Like George, I'm delighted to see you all here and to see how important Aviva's performance is to you. After all, as our shareholders, it's your company. As life has returned to something like normal over the last few months, I've finally been able to get out and about with our people, our customers, and our investors. It's great to be back, and as you'll hopefully soon see, it's great to see Aviva back. Because we are now a much more focused, stronger, and higher performing business than we were 12 months ago. And I'd like to echo George in paying tribute to the huge amount of work that every single Aviva colleague has put in over the last year. It wasn't easy, but they remained 100% focused on delivering for our customers, and in recognition of that, we give all 22,000 of our people 1,000 pounds worth of shares so they benefit from the value that they have helped to create. It's been a good year, but really it's only the start. Everything we've done in the last 18 months or so has created very solid foundations. Now we need to build on them for the next phase, delivering Aviva's promise and realizing the full potential of this business. And the way we built those foundations at speed, with certainty and with excellent execution, gives me real confidence that we can fulfill the potential inherent in Aviva. We focused the portfolio, completed eight disposals, and collected £7.5 billion in proceeds. Aviva is now a much simpler company, with market-leading positions in our attractive core markets, Canada, Ireland, and of course our home market of the UK, which, where we part, I think, of the very fabric of this nation. The successful disposal program didn't just allow us to become much more focused. It also allowed us to rebuild our financial strength. That means that we are in a position to recommend a substantial return of capital to you, our shareholders, which will hopefully be approved this afternoon. And on top of that, we've cut our debt, improved our leverage, and have healthy liquidity. So we have focused and strengthened the company, you will not hear me talk about those elements of our strategy again. They're done. Because it's the third and final element, the transformation of our performance, that gets me really excited. It's where this business will start producing for you, our investors, and our customers, in a way perhaps we have never done before, delivering on the promise of this great company. And you can see that we're really starting to motor. Aviva is growing, and we're growing profitably. Our last set of results showed just that. Life new business sales grew by 23%, driven in part by a record 6.2 billion pounds of bulk purchase annuities. General insurance premiums were up 6% and at their highest level for over a decade. Canada General Insurance had a record year for both premiums and profits. Savings and retirement net flows were up 17%, climbing above £10 billion. That's another record. And Aviva investors showed improved fund performance, increased external net flows, and a 7% reduction in the cost-to-income ratio. But we aren't just growing the business. We're also operating much more efficiently. And we've already delivered a £244 million cost reduction. We've also done what we need to do in order to meet our £300 million commitment in 2022. And we're going to go further as we target top quartile efficiency across the business. 
This all translates into cash generation and a 22% increase in cash remittances to £1.66 billion for 2021. And that gives us the confidence to give you clear guidance on future dividends, which is so important for our investors. For 2021, we've declared a dividend of just over 22 pence per share, up 5% year on year. Following the share consolidation that will accompany the capital return, assuming it's approved this afternoon, for 2022, we anticipate a dividend of around 31 pence per share, rising to 32.5 pence per share in 2023. And we expect sustained low to mid single digit growth in the dividend thereafter. This is an attractive payout level and crucially we believe it is sustainable in the long term. Any surplus capital above our 180% solvency ratio that isn't reinvested in the business to generate more value will also be available to return to shareholders over time. We won't retain excess capital where we can't put it to good use. Our performance over the past year has also given us the confidence to invest further and prudently in the business, as well as set more ambitious targets. We're going to invest a further £200 million to make our business more efficient and simpler, which will reduce costs further. And we are investing £300 million to accelerate our organic growth plans, which we expect will benefit op operating profit by £100 million by 2025. Our priorities include expansion in UK GI commercial lines, innovating to grow in UK GI personal lines, investing in technology for our bulk purchase annuity business, and launching a full range advice model to retain more ass assets as our customers retire. You'll have already seen our acquisition of Succession Wealth in March, which is a really exciting development. It's going to enhance our ability to offer financial advice to six million customers and boost our already strong position in the market. So we've had 12 months of clear progress, but that's behind us now. It's what comes next that matters. What we're going to do with the fantastic foundations that we've worked so hard to lay down. And to do that, we're focused on four strategic priorities. Growth, customer, efficiency, and sustainability. Starting with growth. Aviva combines market-leading positions across every one of our business lines, insurance, wealth, and retirement. We are the number one provider of workplace pensions. We are the leading player in individual annuities, number two in the bulk purchase market, and the leading UK general insurer. And our model gives us real competitive advantage. We've got more than 18 million customers. We can deliver more value with our outstanding brand, we're number one in terms of trust in the market, as well as through our distribution strength, great products, and our customer engagement and service. That scale, along with our shared capabilities and outstanding people, gives us a real competitive edge. Because there's so much more that we can still do for our customers, serving more of their needs and solving more of their problems. And when we deliver for them, we can deliver so much more for all of you. The next step for us is to convert that scale and the power of our model into truly outstanding performance and take full advantage of the attractive growth opportunities available across our markets. In wealth, we see a £1.6 trillion market opportunity to participate in. This grows to £2.1 trillion in 2024. This represents a 7% compound annual growth rate. In insurance, we are in desirable and growing markets and operating in the most attractive segments of those markets. And retirement is another area where an aging population naturally leads to a growing need for retirement solutions for both corporates and individuals. And we are extremely well placed to meet that need. Turning next to customers, they're at the heart of what we do and truly central to our strategy. Our priority now is to put ourselves in a position where we are regularly and consistently delivering an outstanding experience to those customers. We are on a mission to make our customer experience amongst the best in the market, making it far easier for our customers to do business with us and to give them every reason they'll ever need to join and to stay with Aviva. Part of that will depend on getting our digital offer right so that we can bring the full breadth of our products and our services to all our customers in a way that works for them. 
By giving our customers greater influence over how they interact with us, we will relieve our people of many of the repetitive data entry tasks they currently undertake, allowing them to spend more time with our customers on the things that matter to them. And another part of this agenda will be keeping ahead of the changing needs of our customers, particularly as technology evolves, ensuring we continuously innovate to develop new, attractive products and services. Our third priority area is efficiency. We have made excellent progress on our cost targets with strong momentum on things like simplifying our systems, slimming down the number of products and using less office space. But we're by no means done yet and we've issued an even more stretching target for savings by 2024. Finally, our fourth priority area is sustainability. Our customers increasingly expect the custom companies act in a sustainable and ethical way. Aviva has a powerful 30 year heritage here. And I'm determined that we will continue to lead UK financial services on sustainability. We led the pack on climate with our commitment to being net zero by 2040. So far, we have invested £7.6 billion into green assets. We're aligning our underwriting and investment policies to our climate transition plan. And we're offering more choices to our customers, such as our award-winning ESG funds and Aviva Zero. But sustainability is more than just climate action, of course. We're building stronger, more resilient communities too, investing £10 billion in UK infrastructure and real estate to support the economic and social development. And we're committed to reinvesting 2% of our profits into communities, primarily in the UK, Ireland and Canada. We are also changing the way we do business, ensuring ESG considerations feature in our decision-making across Aviva and using our influence to encourage others to do the same. There is a lot of change happening here, but change is exciting. It opens new horizons, brings new challenges, and delivers new opportunities. We've achieved a lot, but really we're only just getting started. Looking ahead to 12 months from now, I hope very much I'll be seeing you all again, either in person or online, like our customers using whatever channel works for you. And I want to be talking to you about our further growth, our continued success as a business, and how we are exploiting the rich theme of opportunities out there for Aviva. We know where we're heading, and we've got what it takes to get there. We really are on track to deliver on Aviva's promise, and I'm very excited about the year to come. Right, I now, um, now propose a move to the formal part of today's agenda. I hope you all had the full opportunity to consider the resolutions and cast your vote. As I said, I will take the notice of meeting as read. However, I'd like to draw your attention to the items of business. First, in resolution one, the directors are proposing to receive and consider the annual report for the financial year ending 31 December 2021. Secondly, resolution two is proposed to approve the director's remuneration report. This resolution is advisory only and has been a means for shareholders to provide feedback to the board. In resolution three, we are asking shareholders to approve our climate-related financial disclosure set out in the company's annual report. In resolution four, the directors are recommending a final dividend for the year ended 31 December 2021 of 14.7 pence per share. The dividend is payable on 19th of May to ordinary shareholders whose names are on the register of members at the close of business on the 8th of April. Resolutions 5 to 14 concern the election and re-election of all directors who retire in accordance with the company's articles. In resolutions 15 and 16, we are seeking approval for the reappointment and remuneration of our current auditor, PwC. Following a competitive tender process, the company announced its intention to appoint Ernst & Young as its auditor for the financial year ending 31 December 2024. Resolution 17 covers political donations. I know that shareholders have raised concerns in the past about the company seeking authority for this matter. I would like to be clear that it is not the company's policy to make political donations or incur political expenditure, and it has no intention of doing so. Resolution 18 confers the, refers to the authority conferred on the directors to allot shares. Resolutions 19, 20, 22, and 23 to 25 inclusive are being proposed as special resolutions. Resolutions 19 and 20 relate to the disapplication of preemption rights and seek authority in line with the guidelines 
to give the board maximum flexibility in order to raise capital. However, I should stress the directors have no present intention of exercising this authority. In regard to Resolution 21 and 22, shareholders recall that in previous years we have requested shareholder approval for the company to issue Solvency II instruments to support the future capital management of the company should it be necessary. This authority expires at the end of this AGM and the board is seeking renewed authority to allow the company to continue to have this flexibility. The board believes that it is prudent to have these authorities in place, although there is no present intention of exercising them. Finally, resolutions 23 to 25 relate to authority for the company to purchase its own shares, and resolution 26 relates to the authorization for the company to call general meetings on no less than 14 clear days' notice. Now, as a final reminder, if you have not placed your votes, please do so now. And if you have already submitted your votes prior to the meeting by proxy and do not wish to change the way you have voted, you do not need to complete a poll card. If there's anyone who's present who is entitled to vote but who does not have a white poll card, please raise your hand and a marshal will pass you one. I'm not seeing anybody. Please ensure you've filled your name uh, and address or the full name and address of the shareholder you represent if you're attending as a proxy or corporate representative. Once completed and signed, the poll card should be placed in one of the black ballot boxes marked poll cards at the back of the auditorium. Only remains for me to say those shareholders who could not attend today have been voting on the resolutions and the final results of the voting will be announced to the London Stock Exchange and posted on the company's website as soon as possible. With that, thanks to all of you for taking part. I will now formally conclude today's meeting. We will now move to take a short break and move on to the general business of the meeting at 3.30 p.m., which I think because the rules cannot be accelerated. So we have to start that at 3.30, so we will have a break, we will disappear, and then we will re reconvene. Those who do not wish to say, stay can make your way out, uh, and I'd invite those staying, staying for the general meeting to be back for half past three. And with that, thank you very much for attending, and have a good year, everyone.